Now, considering the purpose of this esteemed gathering here tonight, as well as current events, I have titled this speech, Seven Pitfalls the Christian Voter Should Watch Out For in 2008, Lest We Fall Victim to the Law of Unintended Consequences. Number one, watch out for voting for a candidate who seems to be a lot like you. Because none of them are even remotely like you. If they seem to be, they are having you on. They're leading you down the garden path. They are pretending to be something that they absolutely are not. I won't be endorsing any candidates tonight because I regard them all with equal suspicion. <laughs> but this first point brings to mind something Governor Huckabee said. Roughly it was this. People would rather vote for someone who reminds them of their next door neighbor than of the man who laid them off. Well, it was a great line, but it's utterly irrelevant. I live in a great neighborhood. I love my neighbors. I think we got two FBI agents in there. A district judge lives in my neighborhood. I mean, we got fine people up and down one street and over the next cul-de-sac. It's just really a wonderful place to live. I wouldn't vote for any of them for president. I, I need a dog sitter. That's another matter altogether. I'm happy to have them for that. Here's what you need to know. Anyone remotely qualified for the office of President of the United States has to be an exceptional man or woman. They are exceptional people. You take Mitt Romney as an interesting case in point. And again, this is not an endorsement, just an evaluation. He has successfully run a large and complicated company and a very important and complicated state, a very difficult state to govern. He has an enormous amount of, of executive experience, which is something a president needs. But Mitt Romney, with all of his experience, which is considerable, has never managed anything remotely like governing the most powerful and complicated nation on the face of the planet. We are a hard bunch of people to govern. Did you know that? We are obstreperous. We bicker a lot. We have our opinions, and we hold to them vigorously, and we will oftentimes fight for them. Governing a people like us really does require an exceptional person. No offense, but I don't want to see anyone like us running the country. I want somebody who is a remarkable, exceptional purpose, person. Number two, watch out for voting on the basis of whether you like the person or not. Iowa turned into what I call a popularity contest. If you just watched that, if you followed all that thing through, you should realize that because of the fact that the candidates are able to interact so much with the voters, it's like your high school most popular contest. Who do you like? Who do you not like? Who turns you off? The truth to tell is some of the most able people in the world are some of the hardest people in the world ever to get along with. You know, there is a man in the Bible whom I love dearly. I think the world of him. I've taught what he teaches for many years in college. His name is Paul. Paul, I believe, in my study of Paul, was one of the most difficult men to be around you will ever find. He was intense. He was combative. He was, in his early years, downright hostile. And the hostility, this is an interesting thing when you read all the way through Paul. That hostility did not go away at his conversion. It just got redirected. He turned it away from the Christians and pointed it at the Jews. And yet he still had all that going on inside of him. If you read Galatians, if you read some of his early epistles, and then you stop and go back and read 2 Timothy, you'll realize what a change took place in that man over the years. Sometimes how converted you are is registered by the number of knotholes you've been dragged through. It's just a fact of life. So I would say, watch out for this. Likeability is a fringe benefit to the presidency of the United States. But the person who becomes our president is going to have to do some things nice people don't do. For example, like blowing a handful of Iranian gunboats out of the water. Those guys have no idea how lucky they are tonight to be alive. But, of course, that may not matter to them. I don't understand their faith. But when I think about this, Jimmy Carter comes to mind. Jimmy Carter was an altogether nice man, a good-hearted man, a gentle man, 
a man who had great Christian principles. And sometimes when I, when I see someone like that in action, I wonder if he understands the difference between Christian principles for us as an individual living our lives in the world and Christian principles for us as a governor, a president, a person who is in the realm of government. It's a different world altogether. Amen. The human rights issue that he pursued was a good-hearted idea. But there are times when you have to be hard-hearted about some issues. I thought about that line, for example, your, the, whoever might have laid, off your, you know, your, laid you off from your job. It doesn't face the fact that it, sometimes it's necessary to lay off a hundred people in order to keep a thousand people at work. It's a hard, tough decision. And we ought to be thankful as a country we have people who are able to make that decision even though they may or may not sleep at night. Taking it on that basis, you've got to think about this. One of the things also that I regretted about Jimmy Carter's presidency, uh, by the way, just for equal time, I also regretted the fact that, that Ronald Reagan, when they blew up the Marine barracks in Lebanon that time, did not immediately send two or three fleets over there and establish a permanent United States naval base on the shores of the Mediterranean. Yep. The fact that he withdrew right after that has led through all kinds of other things. I'll also blame whoever pulled us out of Somalia. Clinton, was it? And when, instead of going in there and punishing the people who did what they did, I blame them for that. You can't back down in the face of these people, or you will pay for it, or if you don't pay for it, somebody else will pay for it later while you're hiding. So anyway, these types of things, and, and the attempt at rescue that was made was so half-hearted, so, so halfway done, it was pathetic. It just seemed to me that, that a person who really had the kind of leadership that was needed and when they took those hostages, in, 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 the American embassy would have declared that an act of war and would have immediately put two or three fleets off the coast of Iran and told them to deliver those people alive or we're going to come in and we're going to take some of your people out in body bags. I really believe if we had taken a real show of force at that period of time, history since that time would have been different. I don't sound real Christian, do I? I'll explain myself in a minute. There, a contrasting example of this comes to mind. His name was King David. He was, you may not know this, King David was the first world leader to disarm Iraq and to pull serious teeth. I think what happened, you'll read about it in the history books of the Bible, in David's life, there came a point in time where David had just had it with the banditry. He'd had it with exactly the kind of stuff that's going on down there right now. And he rolled all the way to the Euphrates River, disarmed Iraq thoroughly, and when the Syrians decided on their wisdom that they would go help the people who live in Mesopotamia, David cut them off at the pass, established garrisons in Syria, and pacified the whole region. It was a good thing that David did. But you've got to understand what kind of a man we're talking about here. This is the kind of a man who's sitting around a campfire outside of an enemy city, an enemy stronghold, looks down at it and he says to his guys, boy... Boy, I'd sure like to have a drink of water from that well that's down there. That's the sweetest water anyway. And two of his guys went in there that night and got it and killed a few people in the process and brought it back to him. And the kind of leader that David was poured the water on the ground and wouldn't drink it. He said, that is the blood of the men who went down there to get it. Wouldn't drink it. You've got to have people like that in the world. David was a bloody man. God wouldn't let him build a temple because of it. But you still got to have them. And David was also a man after God's own heart. So, we have to look at that. Number three in my list of pitfalls you've got to watch out for. Watch out for any promises of compassionate government. You've heard that before, haven't you, about compassionate conservatism? When someone starts talking to you about compassionate conservatism, anything compassionate dealing with government, put your hand on your wallet. <laughs> Compassion is a human emotion. Government is not human. It's a system. It's not capable of compassion. Indeed. We should not expect compassion. We should not even think what, it, whether you want it or not is irrelevant because the government can't get it for you. Now, since I'm talking to a church in a Christian group, perhaps a short reference to the Bible would be in, in order. Romans, the 12th chapter. And in verse 17, the Apostle Paul writes, and he says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. 
which kind of implies that sometimes it isn't possible, doesn't it? Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. In other words, don't avenge yourselves, depending on the translation. It is mine, and I mean, leave room for God's wrath, because it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of fire on his head. And I know some people that I would like to see that result. <laughs> Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. Now, all of these instructions are given to us as Christians in private life. If you ever have governmental responsibility, as our friend Mr. Cervantes has back here, the rules change. Because when God says, I, 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 vengeance is mine, I will repay, he now is going to tell us, Paul is, that government is the instrument of God which he uses to repay. Romans 13, verse 1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority but that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against that authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And what was the government? Rome. Rome. For rulers are no terror to people who do right. Right, Mr. Cervantes? <laughs> no terror to people who do right. But to those who do wrong, do you want to be free from the fear of those in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend, commend you. For he is God's servant to you for good. If you do wrong, be afraid. He does not bear the sword for nothing. Which he then says capital punishment is one of the obligations of the state. Amen. There it is. Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible pun punishment, but because of your own conscience. Now, Paul doesn't discuss in this area what you should do if you're the one in authority as a Christian, because a Christian in any governmental ro role was a pretty remote idea at that time. A person doesn't lay his Christian conscience aside when he enters government. government but he takes on a whole new layer of responsibility for government. In other words, you can no longer turn the other cheek if you're in the role of a law enforcement officer. Your job is to protect the person who does have to turn the other cheek. And this is something I, you know, I'm going through this because I think this is a lesson Christian people need to carry with them. Too often, we tend to shy away and we, we kind of think you're supposed to carry you know, that a government is supposed to be compassionate. It can't. Every time it tries it, it screws up. Example, Hurricane Katrina. By all accounts, government failed miserably. Who stepped up and performed magnificently? You know? The churches did. In Tyler, there were five shelters. Four of them were in churches. And the fifth one was a university, and it was staffed manned and financed by the churches in Tyler. I imagine you have something similar to that. If they came here, they tended to go to Tyler because we were next to the interstate. The churches, God bless them, stood up and really made a difference in that crisis, and they made me really proud of them in seeing that take place. Number four in my pitfalls you've got to watch out for. Watch out for voting for or against any candidate because of his religious beliefs. The Constitution says there should be no religious test for any office. And as voters, we need to keep that and honor that particular item. shouldn't happen. Secondly, it's a, you're talking about his professed religious beliefs in any case. And by now, if you've lived, been a Christian for very long, you know that there's oftentimes a gap between certain someone's profession of their Christianity and the way they actually perform, right? Therefore, I think we apply the same test to candidates for public office. We look at how they perform, not at what they say about their faith. How many religious people do you know who talk a good fight and don't live it? Unfortunately, sometimes probably you have to count yourself. As someone famously said, we are electing a president. We are not hiring a preacher. I wonder who he's talking about. <laughs> what we want in a president is a person of proven ability with the temperament of an executive. What his religion is, 
we don't need to worry ourselves too much about that. A lot of people have been very negative about Romney and about his religious faith. I don't know much about it. I could never be a Mormon, what I do know about the Mormon faith. But I have got some neighbors that are as fine a people as I have ever met in my life and some of the best neighbors that exist in our place. Number five, watch out for voting for a candidate on the basis of his or her promises. Oh, I'm sorry. I probably didn't even need to say that, did I? <laughs> but there's one, there's one word that keeps going around now in the political world. Change. Have you heard that? I mean, I got to the place where I'm going to start throwing shell stuff at the television set. Hopefully, things that are small and soft. But because I keep wanting to say, change what? What are you going to change? I'm concerned about that. And no, hardly, well, hardly anybody will ever ask them about it. And I've only heard one of the candidates, I think it was Rudy Giuliani, who finally came up and said, you've got to think about this question of change. What is it you're going to change? Because you can change from something that doesn't seem to be too good to something considerably worse. I mentioned earlier the law of unintended consequences. There's all kinds of stuff that can happen. You really need to know what you are changing, why you are changing it, and what you're going to get out of it on the other side. Just because it's a fresh face, someone new. I, you know, I watched this, this argument between Hillary and Obama that keeps going back and forth. And I keep hearing Obama talk about change. The only thing I know that he's going to change is he's going to pull the troops out of Iraq and, uh, you know, things like that. And I, 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 I just don't understand how he cannot realize what that will mean and how anyone with the milk of human kindness anywhere in his body could actually walk away from those people and leave them at the mercy of the people they'd be leaving them to. I don't understand that. Uh, and the person can have perfectly good conscience, but reality should come into play somewhere in the political process. That's one of the things that I, I worry about. There's a whole litany of, of promises out there of things I really like, actually coming from Ron Paul on one side, coming from uh, 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 Mike Huckabee elsewhere. I really like the fair tax idea, but I would have more respect for a candidate who told me the truth. Truth is, the fair tax would be good for the con country, but it will never pass Congress. Well, is there something about a snowball in hell that comes into play at this point? Now, I would respect a candidate who would stand up and say, I would like to do away with the IRS. But unless you people do something about Congress, it will never happen. Now, that's honest. And when a person starts talking that way, I start paying a little more attention because I, I just don't hear reality coming into play. I don't think some of these people don't understand the consequences of some of the things they're talking about doing. You need to think those consequences through. Don't just swallow it, what they say they're going to do, and think, oh, well, that's going to help me a lot. I think a lot, by the way, about this universal health care thing. How many of you folks in here are on Medicare? You do realize, don't you, it's not going to get better under universal health care. I'm not going to tell you it'll get worse. I am going to tell you it's not going to get better. And that's one of the things I keep looking around saying, wait a minute, they're going to put us all in a single payer series, and da -da 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 -da. I'm happy where I am right now with Medicare. I don't necessarily want to see a change. And that's another example of a change that I may not want. I think I heard Mrs. Clinton say universal, uh, sorry, uh, Medicare for everybody. I thought we were going broke on Medicare that we had. <laughs> uh, well, whatever. Six, number six of the pitfalls. Watch out for any candidate who talks like he is running for absolute monarch. What am I talking about? Well, my example is Senator Clinton, who promises to take money away from the oil companies and give them to poor families, or whatever it was she was going to do. You know, you would think there was no Congress, or there wouldn't be after she gets to be the president. I'm going to take, I am going to take money from this people. I am going to do this. I am going to bring that. She sounds like she does. She's going to be able to rule by fiat when it's over. Now, again, I'm not unendorsing her or endorsing anybody else. I'm just saying, watch out for that, because listen for people who don't acknowledge the existence of Congress. Congress is, after all, our people up there helping govern on our behalf. And pay attention to who you elect to Congress. It is important. 
I don't think anybody, by the way, understands that big oil is owned by a lot of funds in which a lot of working stiffs have their IRAs, their 401ks, and so forth. And a lot of them probably don't know where they are. Just as a matter of interest, how many of you know precisely what stocks any of your retirement funds are in, just out of curiosity? Yeah, see, that's my point. And he's paying a lot of attention, spending a lot of time, or he wouldn't, or maybe he doesn't have any to watch. But anyway, you see what I mean. You may very well have money in, in one of those big oil companies that she's going to take $50 million away from her, or more. Or is it billion? Yeah, I thought so. Anyway, be careful about that. Number seven, this is the last one. Normally on Johnny Carson's show, he used to get a hand at it, and he said, this is the last one. <laughs> Watch out for any suggestions that Jesus would endorse one or the other of these candidates. How would Jesus vote for for a president? I've heard the question asked. The question is idle. All Jesus' life and ministry took place under a top-down authoritarian government where nobody had any choice in anything except the top guy. So there's nothing to learn there. Actually, I think that whoever it was that came up originally with this, what would Jesus do, came up with a pretty good little slogan for young people. However, for people our age, it's far better to ask, what does Jesus tell me to do? That's important. Because I have to guess about what I think he might do if he were in this circumstance. I have a hard enough time just doing what he said I should do all the time. That's hard enough. So I shouldn't go down that path. Now, if you want to know how civil government would function under Jesus... You'll have to go back to Israelite history before the monarchy. And really, I don't know how well you've studied your Bible or how thoroughly you know that period of time, but from the time of the conquest under Joshua, when the people you know, came in, their land was divided out by lot, they ran out, most of the people who were there ahead of them, unfortunately, they didn't get rid of them all. And they all settled into a really easygoing, uh, free life. They were living in their first days after the conquest as free as human beings ever have lived on the face of this earth. How were they governed? Families, elders, people who were judges selected by the people. Uh, They had a court system. The court system, if we read in the Bible about people sitting in the gate, that's the courthouse steps. That is the courthouse steps. Same thing as it is in in our society. And so consequently, they would sit in the gate, the elders would, or the judges would, and people would go there to hear cases, have their case heard by the judges. And the judges would decide, and, they would, and, and, and the decision would be carried out. They had the cities of refuge that a person could flee to if he was guilty of manslaughter or murder. He could still flee there, but if they tried him once he got there and he was a murderer, he died. Who decided? The people decided. There was No central government in those days. It was a nation under God, a nation with the government of the people, of the people, by the people, and for the benefit of the people. It failed because they failed their duty to God and country. I'm so pleased to see people here that... that, are heading off in a better direction than that. These people lost the freest society any society really has ever known. It had responsibilities. It got they they hurt from time to time. They went hungry from time to time. They helped one another whenever they were going hungry. All of the benefits you were going to look for from anybody had to come from your neighbors. And they were free. Don't worry. We're not going to ever be Where they were, we've gone too far in the wrong direction. But stand up for freedom is absolutely the most valuable thing that we have ever been given.